dive into God's word and continue to discover what his word is for us, especially through vocation. Take a look at this video. Growth takes time. It doesn't happen in a second. It doesn't happen in a day. It takes patience and sometimes a little water and sunlight. But it's always happening, even when you can't see it. When it is finally accomplished, it is a beautiful thing. Well, good morning to you. It is good to be here at Thorn Campus this morning as we gather around God's Word. Uh, it's been a bit since I've been back at Thornton Campus, and so uh, some of you think you're really funny, and you've come up and like introduced yourself to me like I don't know who you are, so <laughs> that's really great. But uh, it's really good to uh, be here as we open God's Word together. If, for those of you joining online, uh, welcome, and also our other campuses, welcome as well. If you don't know who I am, I'm Matt Manning, one of the pastors here at Crossroads Church, and it is uh, good to be here uh, this morning as we continue our series in bloom where we're looking at what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? What does it mean to uh, live our whole life as a reflection of, of who, uh, of, a reflection of, of what God has done in our lives as we head into Easter? And as we've gone through these weeks of this series, now we're in week three, as we've gone through the first two weeks of this series, what we've noticed is that at, even at the very beginning of, of Jesus' ministry, uh, people were starting to realize that Jesus was pretty special. Now one day John, uh, Jesus is walking through town and, and there's this guy named John the Baptist who was there and he saw Jesus walking by and he said, hey, there's Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God. And as he made that declaration, there was a couple of other guys standing there and they decided that they were going to start following him. And they were going to start like, you know, tracking him down and going where Jesus went and all the rest. And, and eventually Jesus turns on them. And he asked him this very pointed question, and it's the question that's really been kind of the, the emphasis of this whole series, Bloom. And the question is this, is what do you want? What is it that you are seeking? What is it that you desire? And what we've come to find out is that this is the most fundamental question when it comes to discipleship. That this is the question that rocked my world uh, for a few months during uh, the summer of last year. What do you want? What do you want? It's a piercing question that gets to our heart, our longings, our wants, our desires, that ultimately it is the overflow and the wellspring of which all of our behaviors and actions flow out of. It's a question that invites us into a journey of deeply connecting with Jesus and slowing down to be with him. It's where we find that, that faith, that our saving faith, that discipleship is being satisfied in all that God is for me in Jesus. And as we've moved through this series last week where we left off in our journey is just after discovering an environment, an environment that Jesus gives to us. And he says, in this environment is where your discipleship best grows. That in this environment, this environment is the environment in which your discipleship thrives. And what we came to find out last week is that environment is an environment of authentic community built around the ethic of love. And the way that Jesus reveals that truth to us is in a quite dramatic way. That it's during the Passover week, a, a huge Jewish festival that happens every year, where the Jews celebrate their, um, their, uh, God's faithfulness in releasing them from Egypt during the Exodus and the time of Moses. And Jesus and his disciples are in this Passover week celebrating Passover and, and all that goes with it. And so they're sitting down and they're eating the feast. They're enjoying dinner together. And in that moment, as they're enjoying dinner together, Jesus drops on them this bomb that Judas will betray him. That Judas is the one who will go to the religious leaders, sell him out, and ultimately that will lead to Jesus' death. And as John, the writer who is, who is writing this account for us, is taking all of this in, his mind is churning as he watches this all unfold before him. That Judas leaves to go betray Jesus. Jesus doesn't stop him. All of this is happening. It's great confusion, emotional turmoil all around. And in the midst of that, Jesus decides to talk about discipleship and what discipleship looks like. And he brings his disciples around him and he says, look, there's a place that I'm going that you cannot come with. That there's a place where I'm going and you will not be able to go with me. And, 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 and he goes, as... As of right now, your discipleship is seen through my physical uh, mark of my physical being here. 
that people know that you're my disciples because you follow me around, that everywhere I go, you're with me, that the mark of your discipleship is my physical presence, but there's a time that's coming, and it's coming soon, that where that will no longer be the case, that people will not know that you're my disciples because I won't be here for you to follow. So I'm going to give you a new mark, a new command, love each other. And what happens next is quite remarkable and actually launches us into the discussion today around discipleship. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. As we turn there and read uh, these words together, these words are going to be familiar to you. The verses are going to be familiar to you. And the reason that these verses will be familiar to you is because they are read at almost every single funeral that, that we've ever been to, that you've ever been to. And while these words bring great comfort, great comfort to those who have lost a loved one, that my hope is, is that you'll see that these verses aren't just simply about that, but there's something bigger going on here, that they're telling a, a grander story that I hope that we'll be able to see today. That at the end of John chapter 13, we have this emotionally charged scene where Jesus tells his disciples that he's leaving and that they can't go with them. And Peter, the, the disciple whom we love, uh, because of his, you know, his, his resiliency and his, you know, this uncanny ability to always ask the question that we want to ask, but that we would never really actually ask in that moment. Like, Peter just goes for it. And after Jesus says that he's going away, Peter stands up and he goes, Jesus, where are you going? Where are you going? Wherever you go, we'll follow you. We're, we're, we're followers. Like, we'll go wherever you go. Like, this is a huge moment of confusion the disciples don't want to believe what Jesus is telling them. They, does, they don't want to listen to what Jesus has to say. And Jesus in this moment calmly replies to Peter, Peter, again, where I'm going, you cannot come. But soon, you'll be able to come with me. But your time is not there yet. And in this like unyielding stubbornness, Peter fires back at Jesus and says, Jesus, I will follow you anywhere. I would die for you. And Jesus goes, no, no, Peter, my friends, you will cower before dawn. And in this heartbreaking scene, full of emotion, turmoil of the soul, Jesus, the good shepherd, says this, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in me, be uh, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I, uh, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it will be enough for us. If you just show us the Father, it will be enough. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father, how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am am going to the Father. Now when we hear these words, they bring great comfort. These words bring great comfort to our souls. And for centuries, these words have brought great comfort to our souls as Jesus points to the great mercy of God that even in death there is life. And while Jesus won't be here in the flesh, he reminds his disciples that at any moment they can experience him through, through prayer. And even greater than that, Jesus says, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you. 
that one day you will be with me and right now I'm going to prepare that place for you. All very great truths, truths that we hold on to and cling to as believers. And while all of that is certainly true, there's something here deeper. There's something bigger happening here. That Jesus just isn't so much focused on death as as much as he is focused on the disciples living out their lives. That yes, for a moment, Jesus pulls back the curtain of death, and for a moment, we get the glimpse of afterlife. But there's something going on here that's richer. That here's what Jesus is communicating in this passage. That the Father shows his love to the Son by allowing him to share in the glory of world formation and recreation. And the Son shows his love to the Father by ever and only doing the Father's will, making and remaking the world to the Father's glory according to his wishes by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when Jesus looks out at his disciples and says, truly, truly, I say to you that whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and even do them greater than I, this is huge. Because what this means is that Jesus is inviting us in to the love, uh, into the ever-flowing love of the Father, Son, and Spirit, not only by prayer and some kind of like mystical reflection, but also by embracing the Son's mission and working as he did. In other words, that we are his disciples, and point number two is this, that we, as his disciples, are active participants in the labors of the Father, Son, and Spirit that fuels the loving relationship between them. That we are active participants in this. That the call into love is inseparable from the call to share in the labor. That the call to share in the Father, Son, and Spirit's love is inseparable from the call to share in his labor. That Jesus looks at us and says, not only will you do the works that I do, but you will also do them greater than I. To which we go, <laughs> hold on, Jesus. Like, like, did I hear you right? Like, we're going to do our works better than you, greater than you? And Jesus goes, yeah, buddy. And we go, well, hold on, hold on. Like, really? And he goes, really, really. Really, really. And so it just seems to me that if Jesus says that there's these great works for us to do, that we should take some time, at least a few moments, and figure out what is the works that, that Jesus is calling us to, and even to do them greater. And that's what I want us to see today. And so what, in order to accomplish that, what I want you to do is I want you to flip all the way back to Genesis, all right? So go all the way back to the beginning of your Bible, find Genesis chapter 1, turn one page, and you're in Genesis chapter 2, all right? That's where I want you to look. And we're going to read the first three verses out of Genesis chapter 2. And as I read these, what I want you to do is pay particular attention to the word work. Okay? In fact, every time the word work is there, what I want you to do is emphatically say the word, all right? That's your deal. I'll read. You say work. This will work, all right? Let's do this. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Moses writes to us, Thus the heavens and the earth uh, were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all of his that he had done in creation. Here's what I want you to notice. That our God is a working God. That our God is a working God. That the way that the creation account is set up for us is that for six days God works creating this, this world, making this creation a flourishing world. And we're told all throughout the creation account that, that everything that God did, that it was good, it was good, it was good. That this creation has been set in, in, in order. That this creation is, is flourishing. There's an abundance there. There is life. That for six days, God works. And then we're told on the seventh day, he rests. That on the seventh day he rests, not because he was tired or deserved like a week at the beach. That's not what's going on here at all. What God is doing, what's happening here, is what God is, is demonstrating for us in creation. What he is modeling is, is a beautiful rhythm. Six days we work, and then we rest. For six days we work, and then we rest. A beautiful rhythm of discipleship. Six days you work, on the seventh you rest. At the climax of creation, God creates humans. 
He creates this couple, Adam and Eve, and he stamps them with his image, literally puts the thumbprint on them. And as they are, have this thumbprint on them, they are image bearers of this great God, that they represent God's rule and they represent God's reign and creation. But also as image bearers, they are, they are bearing the image of this great working God, that we were created to work, that you are created to work. Not as slaves doing, you know, the menial task that God, you know, considers too, too small for him or doesn't have time for, but as partners to bring about the flourishing in this world. That you were created to work as partners bringing about the flourishing in this world. Now, sadly, for most of us, this is completely lost on us. That we don't realize the massive significance of the partnership that we have with God in bringing about the flourishing of this world. A meaning so significant that if you understood it, it would change the way that you look at your week, your discipleship with Jesus, and your satisfaction in him. Point number three, that you were created to work, and your work matters to God. That you were created to work, and your work matters to God. That all humans were designed to work, to be partners with God in the flourishing of this creation. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, Moses writes these words to us. The Lord God took the man, that's Adam, and put him in the Garden of Eden. That at the very beginning, God takes Adam and he puts them in the Garden of Eden. And then what he does is he gives Adam purpose. There's a purpose statement here. There's a reason that Adam is in the Garden. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Now, this imagery here is, is beautiful, that this is beautiful imagery here, but we miss it because we're not Jewish. We don't think like a Jewish person, so we miss the connections of what's happening here. The words work in deep here is a phrase in the Hebrew, and the only other time that this Hebrew phrase shows up in the Old Testament is in reference to the roles that the priest has in the temple of God. That the only other place that this, that this phrase happens, anywhere else in Scripture, is in the descriptions of the roles of the priest. That the priests were to work and to keep or secure the temple of God. That was their role. Now, the temple of God wasn't just some, like, random building in Jerusalem that people went to. That the temple of God for the Jewish person represented the dwelling place of God. Very significant. Now, when the Jewish mind would read these words in Genesis about creation, what they understood it to be saying is that creation itself is the dwelling place of God. That God created this world to live with his people. And Adam's vocation, his, his calling, was vitally connected to the garden. That his vocation was to cultivate it, to work it, to keep the garden. It was to flourish under him. There was to be an abundance of fruitfulness. There was to be life everywhere. But the garden was not the end all. The garden was just the beginning. That Adam's vocation was to extend the garden throughout creation, the dwelling place of God, to the entire earth. That the garden was just a prototype of something much richer and much greater to be a part of. And this vocation given to Adam all the way back at the creation account has never been revoked by God. That we as humans still have this command that we are to work and to keep God's creation. That we are to bring about flourishing and order and restoration into this created world. That this is the work that Jesus is talking about. That God created the world to dwell with his people, and we, disciples, the people of God, have been given this priestly role, every single one of us. We have this role to work and keep creation, serving people in order that the world might bear the image of God, the dwelling place where God lives with his people. So when you go to work, wherever that might be, in manufacturing, in, in business, in government work, in nonprofit work, wherever that might be, you are going into the world as a priest of God, bringing growth and abundance, order and flourishing to this creation. And let me just tell you, if we were ever able to get that, if we were ever able to embrace that, and understand work in this way, then we would begin to work with hope because we would realize 
that doing our work well is loving your neighbor. That doing work well, anything worth doing and doing it well is loving your neighbor. That Alex Statler is a guy that goes to uh, this campus. He attends Saturday night. Great young guy. He uh, helps with our young adult ministry, leading that. And by week, that during the week, uh, he manages a warehouse. That he manages a group of guys who pull parts for um, autos, for cars and trucks and all that kind of stuff. They pull auto parts, and uh, they're responsible uh, for getting those parts out into the world for one of the largest auto part corporations, uh, companies in the world. All right? Day after day, this is what they do. They get a number of a part. They take that part. They go find it. They pull it off the shelves. They take it. They make sure it gets delivered. Hour after hour, day after day, that's what they do. Get the part number, find the part, make sure it gets delivered. Now, just imagine for a moment with me if all of those guys all around the world, that every, every auto part puller off of shelf guy all around the world decided that their job wasn't meaningful that their job wasn't significant, that nobody would care if they just stopped doing their job, that nobody would even notice. And so one day, they all decide that they're just going to stop doing it. What happens? All of a sudden, transportation ends. People can no longer get to and from work, that food vanishes from store shelves, gas pumps go empty, streets are no longer patrolled, utilities go dead. And that's just one industry that our work, whether paid or unpaid, skilled or unskilled, glamorous or completely unnoticed, serves human needs. That our work, done well, is loving our neighbors. It is by working, and only by working, that we are able to provide people the needs that they have in order to survive and to flourish in this creation. And I really wish that we had the space and the time for every single one of you to stand up one by one so that I could speak into you the significance of your job and the partnership that you have with God in bringing about the flourishing of this creation, the work that he has given us to do. Each profession, regardless of what you do, because whether you are a CEO or a parts puller or a warehouse worker, or a teacher, or a stay-at-home parent, or a lawyer, or in finance, or an airline pilot, or whatever it is, when you do a good thing, and you do it well, God is glorified, and people flourish. Now, just a quick thought on retirement. I know that for some of you, you're here, and you're, you're retired, and you're thinking, oh good, none of this applies to me. Well, hold on, all right? Here's what I have to say about retirement. That one of the most important effects of an intentional approach to a working life is the building of momentum by which the greatest use will be made over the last years of our lives. That God willing, we should have the most valuable things to contribute to the kingdom of God in this world. That we are the Lord's servants, every single one of us. That we are the Lord's servants. And there is always something valuable for us to do. There is always something fruitful for us to spend our time in. And old age is often the greatest opportunity that we are given because we have the wisdom and the experience and because we live in the Western world, we are given the opportunity of space to do whatever God calls us to do. Don't think for a moment that God has done with you, that God has called us to work. And our work matters to him whether it is paid or unpaid. See, if we get this, that we're created for work and that our work matters to God, then we begin to understand, as Dorothy Sayer put it, that work is not primarily a thing that we do, but the thing one lives to do. Dorothy Sayer was one of the, one of the first women to go to Oxford College. Brilliant woman. In fact, of the 20th century, she is one of the most influential uh, thinkers in the 20th century when it comes to Christian thought. That quote comes out of a larger quote that I want to read for you. It'll be on the screen. She said this, Work is not primarily a thing one does to live, but the thing one lives to do. It is, or it should be, the full expression of the worker's faculties, the thing in which he finds spiritual, mental, and bodily satisfaction, and the medium in which he offers himself to God. In nothing 
has the church so lost her hold on reality as her failure to understand and respect the secular vocation. She has allowed uh, work and religion to become separate departments and is astonished to find that as a result, the secular work of the world is turned to purely selfish and destructive ends and that the greater part of the world's intelligent workers have become irreligious or at least uninterested in religion. But is it all that astonishing? How can anyone remain interested in a religion which seems to have no concern for nine-tenths of his life? But this last week, I asked my dad if he'd look over this sermon. My dad is an accomplished businessman, and he has done a good job his entire life of integrating his faith and work as a, as a means of his discipleship. And after reading my sermon, he said this, living a God-centered life is not just about going to church. It's also about what we do, how we do it, the people we meet, and who we work with, the other 90% of our time. That you were created to work, and your work matters to God because you are partnering in bringing about the flourishing in this creation, the glory of God. And so when Jesus says to us, truly, truly, I say to you, that whoever believes in me shall, shall do the works that I do and greater works than these he will do. We take that at face value. We take that as a promise that God is calling us into the significant work of bringing about the flourishing in creation that John records for us that this is the fifth time, the fifth time that Jesus uses this phrase, whoever believes in me. Five times in the Gospel of John, Jesus uses this phrase. And every time he uses this phrase, what he's doing is communicating that this is normal Christianity. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to believe. This is what it means to be a disciple. So whenever Jesus says, whoever believes in me does this or does that, what he's describing for us is the normal uh, Christian life. What he's describing for us is what does it look like to be a disciple? There is no exclusion here, that this is amazing. You shouldn't read this and think, oh, if I was a pastor or a missionary or in ministry, then God would do great works in me. That's not what's happening here. That Jesus looks out at every single one of us and says, disciples, pure and simple, will do the works that I do, and greater works than these he will do. See, Jesus came into this world not just to forgive us our sins and to give us a golden ticket to heaven. He also came into this world so that we might know what it means to be fully human. Here's what I mean by that. What's completely lost on us is for 30 years, Jesus was a carpenter. For 30 years, he was a carpenter. Now, most scholars believe that when the New Testament uses the word carpenter, it's not carpenter like we think of carpenter, working with wood, but it's actually a stonemason. That more likely than not, Jesus was a stone thrower building Roman roads. That's what Jesus did for the first 30 years of his life. He was part of the highway crew for the Romans. And then at age 30, his vocation changed. Not to something better, just to something different. He went from being a, th a stone thrower to being a teacher. That he went from being this carpenter to a rabbi. See, Jesus gave his whole self not just to forgive sin, but so that we could once again know what it means to be fully human, serving and partnering with God into bringing about the flourishing of this creation for all of God's glory. And what Jesus does is he looks at you and me and he says, I have gifted you. I have blessed you. I have given you skills. Now you flood into this world and you use those gifts and you use those skills as priests to bring about the abundance and the flourishing and the order and the peace into my creation. Make the creation flourish. Let people see that this is the dwelling place of God. So whether you stay at home as a parent or are a CEO or a business leader, or work in the airlines, or our government, or our nonprofit, or you work for a church. Your work matters to God, that you were created to work as a partner in bringing about the flourishing of this community. All week, I've been praying this prayer for you. It's going to be on the screen. 
that my hope is that every day that you would wake up and that you would say these words, Jesus, what you have called me to do with my mouth and my hands and my feet and my mind, let me do it well because it is worth doing for your glory in the flourishing of this world. Will you pray with me? Father, we um, know that your presence is here. And God, as we hear these words and, and try to wrap our minds around it, Lord, I pray that every single one of us would know that the significance of the calling that you've placed on our lives. Lord, that the jobs that we have and the work that we do, that that is not by accident. God, that you have placed us there as priests to bring about your flourishing in this creation. God, it is, it is so remarkable to us, every single one of us, when you say that, that we will do even greater works than you. God, I pray that we would be faithful in that. God, I pray that, that, we would, that we would hold that near to our hearts, that we would see that as a promise, Lord, that the works that you have given us to do were set before even the foundations of this world. And so, God, I pray that as a people here at Crossroads Church, Lord, that every day when we awake, Lord, we would say use our hearts and our minds, our hands and our feet, to do the good work that you've called us to do. And Lord, help us do it well to bring about your glory. So God, we need some courage. We need some perspective. We need to be reminded about that continually. And so Lord, I, help, I pray that you would help us get there. Lord, I thank you for the way that you work and the way that you speak to us. It reminds us of how good you are. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.